It may seem peculiar to begin a class on horse behavior by talking about psychology, since people often think of psychologists as doctors who counsel those with emotional issues. In fact, when I was working on my undergraduate degree in psychology and equine science, someone asked me if I planned on becoming a horse therapist. That called to mind an image of a Shetland pony lying on his back on a sofa while I asked him to tell me about all his problems. While that's a cute mental image, obviously none of us plan on becoming horsey therapists with an extra large horse sofa. When you understand how horses learn, you become a better trainer. You can train more quickly and help the horses you train retain knowledge. You will also avoid accidentally teaching horses lessons you wish they hadn't learned. The first two lessons on psychological terms will be a brief overview of learning theories. If you find this interesting, like I do, check out an advanced book on psychological learning theories. As horse professionals, the learning theory that we're most interested in is behaviorism. At its very basic level, J.B. Watson, the father of behaviorism, said that behaviorism was the study of stimuli and responses. In other words, something happens, known as a stimulus, and the animal does something. That's the response to the stimulus. An example is you crack a whip, the whip being the stimulus, and the horse begins cantering. The cantering by the horse is the response. Or if you pull on a rein and the horse turns, pulling on a rein is the stimulus, the horse turning is the response. You open the feed room door, that provides a stimulus, the response from the horse is that he whinnies and neighs. If you think about most things that horses do, or even human beings, you can identify the stimulus and response. Behaviorists study only what they can observe when watching an animal and focus on how new behaviors are acquired through conditioning. Behaviorists don't study the thought processes, emotions, or feelings that happen internally. Because animals can't tell us what they are thinking and feeling, we must observe their behavior to guess what's going on internally. This makes behaviorism especially relevant when studying horses and other animals. While we can't ask a horse what he's thinking or feeling, we can watch him carefully to see what he does. Psychologists have developed several behaviorism theories, but operant conditioning and classical conditioning, implemented by B.F. Skinner most infamously, are the most important today in horse training and behavior. Operant conditioning is a form of behaviorism put forth by Skinner. In that, it is said that changes in behavior happen because of an individual's response to events that occur around him or to his environment. He described an operant behavior to be any behavior that operates on the environment and generates consequences. For me, an easy way to remember how operant conditioning works is that operant conditioning occurs when an animal operates on the environment. Skinner used rats to formulate his basic theories of operant conditioning. He placed rats in a box that contained one or two levers. When the rat pressed the correct lever, he got a piece of food as a reward. In the beginning, the rat didn't know what he was supposed to do. He wandered around the box, exploring his new place. We all know the story by now if we've taken a Psych 101 course of B.F. Skinner. The basic example of operant conditioning explains how the consequences of what at first appears to be a random yet voluntary behavior determines whether or not the animal repeats that behavior. Pushing the lever initially was a random behavior, but because the rat was rewarded with food when he pressed the lever, he gained incentive and motivation and a pre-programmed disposition to keep pressing it. Hopefully, with this model, you can see how horses learn through operant conditioning. 
It may be a bit harder to understand how we train them using operant conditioning. That's where a refinement to Skinner's theory comes into play. The use of a discriminative stimulus. A discriminate discriminative stimulus doesn't cause a behavior excuse me discriminative stimulus doesn't cause a behavior but it can influence it because when the discriminative stimulus is present the desired behavior is reinforced and the alternate behaviors are not reinforced this increases the likelihood of the behavior in the presence of the discriminative stimulus an example of this would be whenever your horse walks up to you in the pasture, you give him a piece of carrot. That's basic operant conditioning. Your horse does something, walks up to you, and something happens. Uh, he gets a carrot. If he likes carrots, he's more likely to walk up to you when he sees you in the pasture. Now, if you rattle the chain on the pasture gate and your horse walks up to you and gets a carrot, you've reinforced the desired behavior of walking up to you. However, if you rattle the chain and he doesn't walk up to you, there's no carrot. The chain rattle is the discriminative stimulus. When your horse hears the chain rattle and comes up to you, he gets a carrot. That's just the best way to train animals. Perhaps humans were, were still debating the ethical ramifications of that. Most cues in horse training are discriminative stimuli. If the horse does what you ask him to when you give him a cue, the behavior is reinforced. If he does something else, his behavior is not reinforced or rewarded. After several repetitions, he becomes more and more likely to respond to your cue. The cue doesn't make him perform the behavior, but it can increase the likelihood that he'll perform the behavior. It also signals to him that when a behavior is appropriate, a stimuli of appropriate measure is given. Things known as reinforcers, we'll go over that now. In operant conditioning, the benefit of the theory occurs through the use of rewards. These are called reinforcements and punishments. Reinforcements strengthen a desired response, while punishments eliminate an undesirable response. Example, if you pet your horse, that's a reinforcement. Each time he stops, when you say, whoa, he'll be more likely to stop when you say the word whoa. So if you pet the horse every time you issue a verbal command, the horse will relate the associations of the petting, the pleasant feeling of that, and your verbal command and the tone of voice you set it in, and take that as a cue to perform the requested behavior. If you jerk on the horse's lead rope each time he tries to bolt past you, eventually he stops bolting past you. That would be a punishment uh, versus the petting of the horse being a reinforcement. There is a distinction to be made between primary reinforcers and secondary reinforcers here. Primary reinforcers are things that are biologically significant. In other words, they're things that are needed for survival, including food, water, rest, oxygen, things of that nature. A primary reinforcer or punishment can also be pain, fear, or discomfort. A horse doesn't have to be taught to respond to a primary reinforcer. The response is more instinctive than learned. Horses are individuals and they pr respond to primary reinforcers differently and uniquely. Some horses aren't as motivated by a chance to rest as others, and some don't like certain types of food. As a trainer, you'll have to figure out the most effective primary reinforcers for each horse in your care and use them. For secondary reinforcers, known as conditioned reinforcers, these acquire their power as a reinforcer through an association with another stimulus that serves as a reinforcer. By itself, a secondary reinforcer doesn't influence a horse's behavior, 
But if you pair it with a primary reinforcer like food, the secondary reinforcer can influence behavior. An example of primary and secondary reinforcers would be something such as telling a horse, good boy, each time he stops. And when you say, whoa, won't increase the rate of a behavior by itself because the horse doesn't know that hearing good boy is desirable. However, if you say good boy each time your horse stops after you say whoa and follow it up with a bit of food, good boy becomes a reinforcer on its own. Then you can use good boy to reinforce other behavior. You ask the horse to trot off next to you when you cluck at him and say good boy when he does so. Good boy will reinforce his behavior of trotting off when you cluck. So you can see how we interchangeably use things like food and comfort to allow us as trainers to incorporate secondary reinforcers that are much more easily used and things that are non-tangible such as a verbal command or comment like whoa or good boy. After something is established as a secondary reinforcer, it needs to be occasionally paired with a primary reinforcer to retain its ability to reinforce behavior. You could say that you need to interchangeably use the reinforcers to keep the power going within the horse's mind that the secondary reinforcers are directly associated and related to the horse receiving one of the more essential primary reinforcers. Operant conditioning uses four types of reinforcers. All of these four types can be either primary or secondary reinforcers. The first is positive reinforcement. The second is negative reinforcement. The third is positive punishment. The fourth is negative punishment, and we'll go over those one by one quickly with examples because they're pretty basic terms. An example of positive reinforcement is when you say, whoa, and your horse stops. When he stops, you pet him. Over time, the horse associates the word woe with positively re reinforced by being petted. A negative reinforcement, you press your spurs into your horse's sides to get him to move forward. As soon as he moves forward, you remove the spurs. That takes away his uncomfortability or pain level. Over time, it takes a lighter touch of your spurs before the horse moves forward. This is known as negative reinforcement. An example of positive punishment would be something as if when your horse pauses in the cross ties, you smack him on the shoulder or yell, stop it. Smacking his shoulder or yelling at him is the positive punishment. And over time, he paws less and less often as the cross ties. An example of negative punishment would be when you're petting a horse and he bites you, you walk away removing the pleasant stimulus of petting. Over time, the horse stops biting when you are petting him. Reinforcers aren't the only thing that influences a horse's behavior. We also have to consider how often we give those reinforcers. This is called the schedule of reinforcement. A continuous schedule of reinforcement is the most simple. Each correct response is followed by a reinforcer. Continuous reinforcement can be hard to maintain. Imagine each time your horse starts trotting, when you cluck at him, you stop him and pet him. You would never get too far, now would you? Another problem is when you use the continuous schedule of reinforcement, eventually the reinforcers lose their value and the horse doesn't respond well. He, in other words, doesn't see the value of the rewards because they're happening on such a continuous basis. It needs to be, uh, the amount of reinforcements needs to be alternated and each of the 
uh, distinctions between the reinforcements needs to be interchanged with things like punishments. Punishment is, of course, the one exception. It works best if you deliver it each time the horse performs an undesired response. Of course, this means you need to pick up appropriate punishments. If you have to smack your horse each time it paws in the cross ties, you can never walk away because you won't be there to punish him if he starts pawing. However, if you yell or growl at your horse as punishment, you can still do that even if you've walked away from him. As long as he can hear you, you can still punish him. In horse training, we often use one of four intermittent schedules of reinforcement. The first of these four distinctions is the interval method. The fixed interval is the type of interval response where rewards are given to the first correct response that occurs each time after a predetermined amount of time passes within one sequence. The variable interval is the reward the horse receives for the first desired behavior after different amounts of time pass through a different sequence of commands. Sometimes it might be five minutes, then one minute, then two minute intervals. One problem with the interval response is that animals don't respond consistently. When animals are on a fixed interval schedule of reinforcement, they figure out how much time has to pass before they get rewarded, and they don't perform the behavior in the beginning of the interval. Then they almost frantically perform the behavior as the end of the interval approaches. For variable intervals, the animal isn't motivated to perform the response because the reinforcer doesn't seem tied to the response. And our next distinction is between ratios. A fixed ratio is a reinforcement always given after the horse performs a desired behavior the same number of times. The variable ratio method would be reinforcement given after the horse performs the behavior a random number of times. An example between these distinctions is a fixed ratio would be something such as dismounting and letting your horse rest after he performs five correct steps in a row. An example of the variable ratio would be something such as if you reward your horse sometimes by ending his training session after he picks up the correct canter lead one time. The next time you don't end his training session until he picks up the correct canter lead three times. Then you end the next training session after he picks up the correct canter lead twice. Ratio schedules of reinforcement are the most effective schedules of reinforcement, and good horse trainers typically use a variable ratio of reinforcement, usually without actually knowing that they're doing it. In this case, of course, we would know, and we could see the logic justified as being thus. The reason the horse responds best to the variable ratio is because you are alternating the frequency. The variable is changing uh, on a consistent basis, which allows the horse to be continually surprised by the rates at which you prescribe to him less punishments and more rewards. Moving on, we know that a reinforcement can increase the likelihood of a response and that punishment decreases the likelihood of a response. But what happens when we stop giving reinforcers altogether? What happens when we stop giving encouragements and just expect the horse to operate on their own without any type of punishment or reward in place? Eventually, your horse would stop performing the behavior you've conditioned or trained them to do, and this is called extinction or extinguishing a behavior. When a horse or animal or human being has no incentive to perform a behavior, they simply will not do it because there's nothing in it for them. There's no benefit they can see, uh, and 
using the principle of utility in a way, they come to the decision that the behavior is no longer serving them and they stop performing it. Regardless of the type of reinforcer or the schedule of reinforcement you use, it is important to pay attention to when and how you deliver the reinforcer. To influence how often the behavior occurs, the reinforcer needs to occur immediately after the behavior. For example, when you press your spurs into your horse's side in an effort to get him to move quickly, you must release those spurs as soon as he speeds up. If he speeds up and you keep pushing the spurs in his side, he won't know what you want from him. Another example is when a horse bites you, you must punish him immediately. If you wait 30 seconds and then smack him, he won't associate the smack with the bite. In fact, he might associate the smack with walking up to you, and he might stop coming around you altogether. One, one of the reasons secondary reinforcers can help us as trainers is that they're often easy to deliver right away. If your horse stops, it can take you a minute to get off of him and let him rest, but you can immediately praise him with a good boy, or give him a pet on the neck. The term shaping is used to get a horse to perform complex or unnatural tasks. When you shape a behavior, you begin by rewarding the smallest step in the direction of the behavior you wish to achieve in the horse. When the horse is consistently performing that behavior, you reward closer approximations of the behavior. Over time, you reward closer and closer attempts to the desired behavior until you are only rewarding the exact behavior you want. An example would be something like, when a horse doesn't naturally know that you want him to back up, when you pull back on the lead rope. So, in the beginning, you pull back on the lead rope and your horse might just lean back a little bit. You reinforce that behavior by saying, good boy, or by giving him a piece of carrot. When he's consistently leaning back, when you pull on the lead, you ask for a little more. Now you want him to shift his weight onto his back legs. When he's consistently shifting his weight in response to your pull on the lead, then you begin only to reinforce him when he picks up one foot and moves it backwards. If you continue reinforcing closer and closer attempts at backing up, eventually your horse backs up when you say, back. Now, much of what horse trainers do involves shaping. You expect and reward small tries by greener horses. As a horse's training progresses, you expect him to respond with more and more precision, and you only reward for more and more perfect responses in the desired behavior you wish to produce in the animal. Although this short lesson probably seems like it covers a few psychological terms, this is only the surface of operant conditioning. We still need to review a basic understanding of the way horses, animals, and human beings learn. And in our next lesson, we'll look at terms such as classical conditioning, sensitization, desensitization, and the distinction between them. Also, how classical conditioning and operant conditioning work together in something known as clicker training. And for the next few days, I'll be going over these interactions in which the horses handle all of these reinforcements and punishments within the framework of conditioning. And we will see if we can identify discriminative stimuli, primary and secondary stimuli, and the type of reinforcement used when interacting with a horse, and the preferred methods and logic behind each of those in any given specific scenario or situation. Until next time, we'll review what we've covered today and properly prepare for the next series of lectures.